Adam, our dear brother, fellow worker in the Lord, dear friend uh, to me and to uh, Pastor Jude Atas, who is the pastor of Malala's Christ of the Church. So let us make the most of this opportunity to learn. Just listen attentively. If you are uh, writing down notes, make sure that uh, you listen well, because uh, just in case you miss something, you can always go back to the recording that will be posting. Uh, of course, not, not today, but uh, on a much later date. But we will inform each one of you once uh, the videos are uploaded. So, let's uh, give a warm welcome to our dear brother, uh, Eno D. Scripture that um, the instruments have been <laughs> done away with, but uh, it was wonderful to, to see with you on the um, it, it is a privilege for me and my wife to be here today. Uh, we're delighted and we uh, thank the Lord for your hospitality. Uh, one of the memories I have of uh, Kobe, uh, I meant Kirby, uh, was him studying furiously. Uh, Hebrew in the student lounge in 2017. Uh, he was a very diligent student. And looking back, right, looking back, we see that his study had a very strong purpose with the aim to glorify God in the service of the church. Was, um, so it's wonderful to, to see that. Right? Um, and thank you for this invitation. That's a privilege to um, bring bring to you uh, some historical theology about a man by the name of William Berkeley. So if you take a look at your lecture handout, there are just brief quotes in regards to William Perkins and the lecture. So lecture number one will be going over his context, his opponents, and justification as historical uh, as, as foundation. I think in order to study a historical figure like William Perkins or John Owen or whoever, uh, it's really important to get him in his historical context. And then you can understand him more where he's coming from, what made him right, what uh, made him tick. And so that's the first lecture. And the second lecture will be about uh, his defense, about justification in regards to righteousness as he interacts with his opponents from the Roman Catholic tradition. And then lecture three will be on Perkins and Pauline James and final justification. And the last lecture will be about Perkins on law gospel and how we are to live the Christian life uh, in regards to the third use of the law. And so we go to our first lecture, which is about Perkins' background and historical context. Uh, a Puritan biographer uh, retells of a story of a pastor theologian by the name of William Perkins. Uh, his years are 1558 to uh, 1602. Uh, William Perkins was engaged in prison ministry in a local castle jail in England early on in his career. And the biographer recounts of a young criminal in the gallows who was in the depths of despair, about to be put to death. Perkins said to him, What man, what is the matter with you? Art thou afraid of death? And the prisoner replied, Ah, oh, no, but of a worse thing. He was afraid of what would come after death. Perkins responded, Come down again, man, and thou shalt see what God's grace will do to strengthen you. The criminal came down, and Perkins then delivered to him the gospel in which the criminal believed. And as the biographer wrote, quote, The black lines of all his sins were crossed and canceled with the red lines of his crucified Savior's precious blood. This was the aim of William Perkins' ministry in England in the 16th century, to win souls and to base a biblical morality 
that was grounded in the gospel and not one's own self-righteousness. Yet who was this man? And what kind of times did this man live in? In this lecture, we will look at, number one, we'll look at Perkins' background and theological development. And then we'll look into his uh, death and legacy. And third, we'll unpack his historical context. Fourth, we will look at his theological opponents. Most of them were Roman Catholic. And lastly, we will under, uh, we'll, we'll unpack why justification was so foundational uh, to William Perkins. Well, first to William Perkins' background in theological development. William Perkins was born in 1558. Uh, his father was named Thomas, and his mother was named Hannah, uh, the same year when Queen Elizabeth came to the throne in England. Uh, per Perkins was born in Warwickshire, uh, the same county that William Shakespeare, six years later, would be born into. And as to Perkins' personality, he's described as cheerful in nature, with a pleasant disposition, reserved to strangers, but once acquitted, very familiar. What well, today we would call an introvert. So William Perkins was an introverted person. Uh, as to his appearance, Perkins is described as ruddy in complexion. He's described as fat and corpulent, and he suffered from a deformity in his right hand. Uh, Perkins was a country boy, and if you had a deformity in your right hand, it's really hard to plow soil and plant crops and on the farm or to harness animals to a plow. And so the academics, I think, well suited him to go in that direction. And so he was left-handed and was called the English Edmund, who would stab the uh, Roman gods. Perkins was born from a land-owning family. According to Patrick Collins, and many heads of land-owning families were now sending their sons to universities. So he's living out of there in the country and he's soon going to go to Christ College, right, in Cambridge. Uh, this is due to the most significant uh, political achievement of the English Reformation, the recruitment of class of country gentry. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, the greatest political achievement would bring forth, according to Richard A. Muller, the most prominent reformed theologian on the English scene in the 16th century. When William Perkins was 18 years old, he enrolled at Christ College in Cambridge in 1577. Uh, Cambridge was known as the center hub of Reformed theology. Uh, also, Cambridge was known as a staunch opponent to Roman Catholic theology. Upon arrival at Christ College, Perkins mentioned that he became interested in astrology, what we know today as black magic. This was before his conversion. And um, later on, he would say that this was very profane and he would repent of it. Further, when he was a young man, it was noted that he was a prodigal, uh, addicted to drunkenness, and he heard a woman say to a child with a, uh, that was forward and peevish, she said, hold your tongue or I'll give you over to drunken Perkins. Uh, Benjamin Brooks claims that this incident was, uh, was Perkins' first step to conversion Yet, this situation is to be believed as apocryphal, meaning maybe it didn't really happen because the, the earliest account was in the earliest 19th uh, century, and Perkins and other biographers don't mention anything about this situation. Yet, what is true about Perkins is that he was converted by the gospel. And so we do know that Lawrence Chatterton, he was an old fella, and he was involved in Perkins' life in a major way. Uh, Chatterton was the oldest Puritan, um, 104, 104 years old. Uh, he's like the Robert Godfrey, right, uh, of uh, Cambridge University. <laughs> well, Chatterton was Perkins' tutor, and he had a great influence on the young man, William Perkins, in his life and his theology. Chatterton would organize these public conferences called prophesying doesn't have anything to do with Pentecostalism. It's just, just that these prophesies, they're named after Zurich in Zwingli. And so these pastors would gather together and they would preach. They would preach sermons to each other uh, for many hours at a time. And then they would uh, criticize the sermons. Hey, these are the things that you could work on uh, in regards to your exegesis and to your delivery. And there was a lot of people 
um, other than students that would come to hear these preachers preach. You know, and so they would get a lot of, you know, preaching done and, and it would be heard, right? And so this definitely, uh, at this time in these prophesies, it definitely helped William Perkins uh, to develop his preaching. Um, Samuel Clark, in his history published in 1650, states that Perkins in his early years was a very fiery preacher, right? Very fiery preacher. But because of these prophesies, later on, uh, later on in his age, uh, he believed that preaching mercy was the proper office of ministers of the gospel. In addition, Chatterton also organized uh, study groups at Christ College, Cambridge, which were reminiscent of the White Horse Tavern meetings in England, discussing Luther uh, during Henry VIII's reign. So along with these prophesies where he's sharpening his preaching, uh, in these study groups organized by Chatterton, uh, this is where he is sharpening his exegesis, his exposition of scripture, going back to the original languages of Hebrew and Greek and learning this way. Uh, this was the learning environment of Mr. Perkins. Uh, there is no uh, record of Perkins visiting the continent, like in Geneva or in the Netherlands, uh, as your scientist did, you know, the author of the Heidelberg Catechism, he would go around, right, in a, in a, called a book tour, and he would get his theology book signed from uh, his professors. Uh, but William Perkins didn't do anything like that. Uh, in fact, he did a very, uh, very little traveling, yet Perkins was known as a furious reader. According to Joel Beakey, Perkins was the most widely read theologian of the Elizabethan church. He used the Corpus Christi College Library, and he also owned his own impressive library, probably something like this, which was sold to Bishop Bedell after he died. Uh, yeah, so what, what could we learn from this situation that is a furious reader uh, he got his learning a lot done from books as well, is, is that uh, as spouses, right, we shouldn't be too hard, right, on your husband or your wife when they get that uh, theology book, right? Um, you know, Michael Horton said that books have a powerful force. And if you ask Robert Godfrey, the Scottish Reformation, the Scottish Reformation started with books, it spread of reform literature and the books, and then after that through preaching. Uh, Perkins was drenched in the thought of Augustine, and he was well read in other church fathers. Uh, you can see this, for example, in his work titled The uh, Problem of Forged Catholicism. It was a work showing that the patristic witness, right, that the church fathers, rather than siding with the Roman Catholics, it sided with the Protestant Reformation. Uh, here in this work, Perkins interacts with Ambrose, Jerome, Cyprian, Tertullian. Irenaeus and the like. Perkins also drank deeply from the well of reformed thought. He was a reformed theologian. Uh, Richard A. Nolan and Burma notices the deep influence that uh, Perkins' writings, that Ursinus and Livianus, the authors of the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, some theologians noticed that there was a, a very big influence on, um, Heidelberg, on the Heidelberg Catechism with William Perkins. Uh, Paul Schaefer also notices that Perkins' work on preaching, titled The Art of Prophesying, followed the Heidelberg Catechism structure of guilt, grace, and gratitude. Uh, this is also the structure at Field of Grace Reformed Church, right? Guilty sinners, graciously saved, and gratefully serving. This is the same pattern of the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, this was no surprise since the Heidelberg Catechism was published in 1587 in England and it became popular in England during Queen Elizabeth's reign, uh, during Perkins' time. It was the age of catechism. So they used the catechism a lot to teach, to instruct uh, the little ones to adults. Uh, Heidelberg theology was not the only influence on Perkins. It was not difficult to obtain Calvin and his institutes. Uh, thanks to translations by Anne Locke, although Perkins was a reader and writer of Latin. In fact, John Calvin was the most dominant theologian uh, influence in Elizabethan England, and his work was published and republished more times than any native theologian. Uh, Perkins was also re well read in the writings of the reformers such as Luther. 
So he was a Lutherite. Uh, he learned under Bucer, his writings of Bucer, Beza, Vermigli, Junius, Musculus, Zonki, Polanus, Bollinger, to name a few. And those who came before Perkins, he learned from, uh, authors such as William Tyndale and Thomas Cramner, who was known as the English Calvin, who wrote uh, the 39 Articles. In his sermon on Jude, Perkins was concerned that the people were reading too many Catholic works. I don't know if there's a problem here in the Philippines with two, uh, people reading too many Catholic works. Uh, he complained that his congregation and the people at his university was reading too much of Roman Catholicism and not the books of the Reform. This is what he said to his congregation. He says, the people have addicted themselves to study popish writings and monkish discourses, despising in the meantime the writings of those famous instruments and clear lights whom the Lord raised up from the raising and restoring of true religion, such as Luther, Calvin, Bootser, Beza, and Martyr. A lot happened in 1584 in Perkins' life. In 1584, he received his master's degree from Cambridge. In 1584, he was ordained to the gospel ministry. He held to the 39 articles. Uh, ministers here, we hold to the uh, in the Philippines, I believe, you hold to the three forms of unity, uh, the canon, the Dort, uh, the Belgic Confession, and the Heidelberg Catechism. Well, for Perkins during this time, he held to the 39 articles, and he was ordained in the ministry. And he was also elected as a fellowship fellow at uh, Christ College, Cambridge University. Uh, being a fellow at the Cambridge University, uh, it meant that you were responsible for tutoring students in theology. Uh, Perkins held an academic position at the college for 11 years, from 1584 to 1595. And he was a busy man at the university, and he was actually uh, the dean of students from 1590 to 1591. He catechized students every Thursday afternoons, and he worked as a counselor, so not just preaching, but he counseled people on Sunday afternoons counseling those afflicted uh, and spiritually depressed. Perkins chose to quit his position at Christ College. Uh, there was no controversy there, uh, but he had to quit because fellows had to be married. And so he wanted to be married to a widow named Timothy Cradot. And he married her in June 2nd, 1595. William and Timothy had seven children in total. Uh, three of them who died in infancy. So a lot less than John Owen. John Owen had around 11 kids, and most all but one uh, died in infancy. It's very sad. Uh, in terms of preaching, Perkins was appointed as a lecturer uh, at Great St. Andrews in 1585, and he would preach for 17 years at Great St. Andrews. Uh, it's very interesting, Joel Beakey uh, gives this account that at the church there was a main pastor. Uh, he was an Anglican minister who was uh, called by the Church of England. Uh, this Anglican minister, usually that was uh, appointed by the Church of England, uh, his preaching wasn't good uh, for various reasons. It's just he wasn't able to connect with the people. And so what the churches would do they would keep the Anglican minister, correct? They would keep the Anglican minister, but they would uh, appoint a Puritan preacher, right? And so they would gather together as a congregation and they would vote, right, of who this Puritan preacher would be. And they would be called lecturers uh, who spoke the word and the gospel to the common people. So the common people in England, they really connected with the Puritan preachers rather than the Anglican preachers. So this meant this, the regular preacher would preach on Sunday mornings and the Puritan preacher would preach on Sunday nights and um, Wednesday nights. Uh, and this freed the Puritan preacher to focus more on his sermons because the Anglican minister would be in charge of the pastoral responsibilities and the different uh, responsibilities for the church, freeing the Puritan preacher up. Uh, one of these preachers was known by the name of William Perkins. This was the situation that he was in. 
And so the Reformation Heritage books, they have these 10 volumes, right, that came out. And a lot of them are uh, Perkins preaching, right? And so we have to ask the question, how did he get all those uh, sermons on pieces of paper bound up? It's because he had a lot of time, right? He, he had a lot of time on, on those things, and he had a lot of sermons. Right? Because he wasn't in charge of uh, some of the um, administration side of the church. Although he was uh, very busy at Cambridge University, he had uh, the freedom to hone his craft in his exegesis so he could preach the word of God to the people. Uh, Perkins' death was very sudden. Uh, he died from kidney stones. I know it hurts, it hurt a lot to die from kidney stones. He died on October 16th. Uh, 1602 at the age of 44 he was only 44 years old uh, he left behind his wife and four children and he only been married for seven years it wasn't that long he died a very early death uh, it's interesting in 1597 five years before William Perkins death uh, Perkins was 39 when he wrote this right he said this quote if a man is ready and prepared to die Sudden death is in effect no death, but a quick and speedy entrance to eternal life. Sadly, uh, he wouldn't know that this manner of death would fall upon him. Perkins had a very short ministry, yet he had a very lasting influence on Protestant theology in Elizabethan England and beyond. I think when we talk about Puritans, uh, our minds automatically go to John Owen. You know, he has 24 volumes there. But I think we fail to mention William Perkins, right? Uh, William Perkins came before John Owen, uh, and he, he did have a legacy. Um, Perkins left a lasting mark on his students. Samuel wrote, uh, Ward, one of his students, wrote that Perkins' death, uh, he said this, Consider the great blow given unto the gospel of Christ by the death of Mr. Perkins, who by his doctrine in life did much good to the youth of the university. Uh, the Westminster divine Thomas Bidwin stated that Cambridge, quote, was, fill, was then filled with the discourse of the power of Mr. Perkins, his ministry still fresh in men's memory. Uh, I know uh, Field of Grace was studying uh, the theology from William Ames, right? William Ames, yeah. Uh, William Ames and John Cotton were in fact converted through Perkins' preaching. Ames wrote this about William Perkins, quote, when being young I heard worthy Master Perkins so preach in a great assembly of students and he instructed them soundly in the truth. I think if uh, Perkins lived longer, he was only 44 years old, keep that in mind, he would have possibly wrote as much as John Owen. You know, he has 24 volumes over there, right? Uh, if you think about it, Owen died at the age of 67, living 23 years longer than o um, Perkins, and he had much more uh, time to write. Are, th are there any uh, canon of Dort nerds out there, people who study the canon of, canons of Dort? Yeah, we probably have a lot, right? Well, William Perkins would have been 60 years old during the Synod of Dort in 1618, when he died in 1602, but he, he couldn't be a part of that synod. Um, this synod responded to the Armenians. If Perkins had lived a little bit longer, I believe it's possible that Perkins himself would have been part of that synod of Dort. Uh, there was a British delegate who was around 59 years old, and Perkins would have been 60. He would have went to that synod, no problem. Uh, Arminius, in fact, picked up Perkins' work titled Manner and Order of Predestination in 1598. When we think about Arminius, right, we think about who? We think about Calvin, right? Calvin in Armenia. But it was also Perkins in Armenia. Because Arminius, he actually picked up Perkins' book, right, on predestination, and he responded to Perkins. But Perkins couldn't strike back. Why? Because he died. He died in 1602. Right? And Arminius' work, going against Perkins, was published in 1611. So what does this teach us? It teaches us that Perkins was definitely involved in the theological matters surrounding Dort. So if he lived a little longer, um, he would have responded to Arminius, 
And imagine, that, that response would have been very powerful. If John Owen was too young for the Westminster Assembly, Perkins would have been too old. Uh, he would have been around 80 years old for the Westminster Assembly, which convened in 1643. Yet Perkins didn't have to be there to influence the Westminster Assembly. Uh, I think we forget this, this point, right? There's a lot of people who influenced the Westminster Standards, and one of them was definitely William Perkins. Richard Muller notes Perkins' direct influence, mentioning that, quote, the Westminster Confession was a finalization, a codification of the ground gained by Perkins, Ames, Rollick, Whitaker, and Reynolds. Also, the Westminster Shorter Catechism question and answer seven in regards to the decrees of God, it takes a page from Perkins. So if you go to question and answer seven on the Westminster Shorter Catechism, it's really familiar with some uh, a piece of Perkins' writing. So you see this influence that the Westminster uh, Confession, uh, Perkins had on the Westminster Confession. Uh, Perkins' writings were influential in both the British Isles and in the Reformed churches abroad. Uh, Perkins was a bestseller, uh, not like Joel Osteen, but in a very good way, he was a very bestseller. According to Philip Benedict, more editions of the works of Perkins were published in England between 1590 and 1620. Uh, by 1602, he was publishing and selling more than Calvin, Beza, and Bollinger combined. That's pretty impressive. Uh, the works of Perkins, the three folio volumes, made it to John Owen's library. So if you look at, there's a catalog online, uh, Crawford Ribbon did some work on it, and it, it shows you all of the list of books that John Owen, you know, had. We don't know if you read through them all, probably you did. But one of those works was the three folio volumes of William Perkins in John Owen's library. James Usher, a highly prominent Irish theologian, stated in his recommended lit reading list, he said, two authors that you should read all of their works. Two authors. He said, you must read Rollick and William Perkins. In Seoul, South Korea, over 5,000 miles away, today from Cambridge, a man by the name of Sinclair Ferguson wrote of a Korean seminary professor. This is the 1990s, right? He owned the three folio, John, uh, not John Owen, three folio volumes of Perkins there in Seoul, Korea. This is before the internet, before all the all these kind of writings were available through uh, the internet. And here in the Philippines in 2023, we find ourselves talking about Christ's gospel. Uh, that Perkins defended centuries ago. As, import as, as important as Perkins' legacy was, I believe his the defense of justification is important for the Protestant church today. Uh, Perkins today is called the father of Puritanism. Owen is called the prince of the Puritans. Uh, Perkins is called the father of the Puritans. And I think it would be good to know what this father of Puritanism believed in regards to the article of the standing or falling church. Uh, Godfrey said the first Puritan you should read is William Perkins, right? And so it's best to understand what Perkins believed about this critical doctrine of justification. We can now move on to Perkins' historical context. A lot happened in the universities in Perkins' time, which historians call a world within a world. And so we had the Church of England, and then there was also a different world in the universities. Um, yet, this world within a world could paint a picture that theologians such as William Perkins and Cambridge University were isolated from the public events uh, that happened in England. Uh, the everyday events that happened in Queen Elizabeth's establishment were influenced for Perkins and his writings against his Roman Catholic opponents. Uh, we live in different times than the times of Perkins in the Philippines. Uh, we have a separation between uh, church and state. We are, yet in Perkins' time, was very, very different. It meant that if the queen was Roman Catholic, it meant that the whole land would be Roman Catholic. If the king or queen was Protestant, that whole land, right, would go towards Protestantism. Before Queen Elizabeth, there was a woman by the name of Mary I. 
known as Bloody Mary, right? Reigned in England for about five years. I know it's a lot less than Spain coming into the Philippines. I was talking to the Caribbean, it was 333 years. It was only five years for England. But those five years were very hard for England. Five years were very hard. Within those five years, Mary I burned over 300 Protestants. Not just Protestants on the street, but its greatest theologians, she killed them. Among those executed were famous Protestant knights such as John Rogers, John Cooper, Nicholas Ridley, Hugh Latimer, all murdered in 1555, and the beloved Protestant Oxford Don Thomas Crowder, who is known as the John Calvin, who wrote the 39 articles. The next year, he was burned to death. Just, just imagine, you know, someone going into Geneva and murdering John Calvin, right? And that was the same with Bloody Mary on Thomas Crowder. He lost a great theologian and pastor. Anti-Catholic sentiment in England under Queen Elizabeth was at its highest during the 1580s because Protestant England was under Romanist attack, right? So we have Queen Mary, right, who uh, was the queen, and so the land was Roman Catholic, and then right after we have Queen Elizabeth, right? Mary dies, and now it's Queen Elizabeth first, and so she is uh, reigning in England, and so uh, the country now is Protestant. In the 1570s, though, the Roman Catholics would not like this, and so what they would do under Queen Elizabeth's reign is they would send Roman Catholic missionaries to England, right, to evangelize the people of England. Plus, there were three assass assassination attempts, right, to kill Elizabeth and replace her with a Roman Catholic cousin, Mary Queen of Scots, right? I don't know about you, if someone's trying to kill me, someone's trying to assassinate me, um, it would cause a lot of stress, right? A lot of penal um, legislation would have to be brought about in Elizabeth and England. Beyond this, war with Spain began in 1585, the same year Perkins was appointed as a preacher, and Philip II's Spanish Armada set sail in 1588 to conquer England. If the Spanish Armada was successful, troops would have been on the streets of London, right? And there would have been no way for England to have responded, and the country would have reverted to Catholic theology right away. Catholic thought about assassinating the Queen and making England Catholic, Catholic again by force inevitably brought about strict penal legislation. Peter Marshall records that over half of the total of Catholic priestly martyrs in England were put to death in the crisis years of 1586 to 1592. A lot of Catholic priests died in Elizabeth in England. The 1580s were very intense for Protestant England for Catholicism was lurking in the shadows and was strongly opposed by staunch Protestants. Uh, this is what Marshall calls the perpetual paranoia in the English Protestant psyche. This is what's going on in Perkins' mind. He's thinking, will our land turn Catholic again? Will our land turn Catholic again, right? So this is what is going on in William Perkins' mind. This was the world of William Perkins. They were very turbulent, they were very stressful, they were very uncertain times in which the religion of the land could quickly change to Roman Catholicism. And the people of England needed to be protected, according to William Perkins' eyes. The people of England needed to be protected from the Roman Catholic gospel. Perkins wrote this, he said, we in England have been long delivered from the superstition of Roman Catholicism, and we must not so much as dream to return. Perkins had a lot of opponents. Perkins faced many opponents and a council who corrupted the doctrine of justification. And here we will mention four, as we interact with these four opponents throughout the lectures. The first one was the Council of Trent. Many of you probably know the Council of Trent. Uh, as well as the key defender of the Council of Trent by the name of Robert Bellamy. And number three, known for his catechism, kind of like the Heidelberg Catechism, is known in Reformed theology, a man by the name of Petrus Cananeus and his Catholic catechism that was spreading all throughout England. And a Protestant theologian, not, not a Roman Catholic theologian, but Johannes Piscator was also Perkins' 
um, opponent. Perkins had strong words for the Council of Trent. He claimed, he claimed that the Church of England rejected the Council of Trent and he called it an Italian faction. The Council of Trent took place from 1545 to 1563. And in 1547, they codified their doctrine of justification. Perkins responded to Trent throughout his writings and sermons. And Perkins' other chief opponent was by the name of Robert Bellarmine. Bellarmine was the chief Catholic theologian during the latter part of the 16th century and the early part of the 17th century. Uh, he's considered to be a very prolific writer by Rome. And according to Carl R. Truman, Bellarmine was to be the significant polemical foil for British Protestant theologians from the 16th century and the 19th century. So the Roman Catholic Bellarmine was a very strong influence for um, Roman Catholic theology. Uh, Bellarmine had some fighting words for the Protestants. Listen to this. This is pretty harsh. Bellarmine says this, quote, A hundred Luthers, two hundred Melanchthons, three hundred Bollingers, four hundred Peter Martyrs, and five hundred Calvins, all of these, if they were crushed together in a mortar, would not produce one ounce of true theology. <laughs> this is what Bellarmine said. Further, Bellarmine considered Luther's Protestant doctrine of justification to be the seed of all heresies of all time. This is the, this is the opponent of William Perkins. Perkins also responded to the work of Jesuit Canonius. Canonius was known for his Catholic catechetical work. His catechism made it to the English shores during the Elizabethan era by Jesuit missionaries in the 1570s. There were only three Catholic catechisms that were known in England, and one of them was Petrus Canonius's catechism. It was first written in German in 1555, and by 1579, it was translated into English, so this gave Perkins some problems. Uh, he actually responded to this catechism. Uh, the catechism contained Rome's teaching on final judgment by works and everlasting life by faith, virtue, and submissiveness to Christ. Did Perkins have any Protestant opponents? Well, Perkins would mention the name of his Roman Catholic opponents. It's really interesting. As you read Perkins' works, he's not afraid to use the name of Roman Catholics, like Bellarmine, Canonius, but when he's arguing, right, when he's defending the doctrine of justification against the Protestants, he doesn't name them by name. Um, I think for the reason why, because he wants to give a little bit of charity, but he la labels them as some Protestants, right, but he doesn't name, label them by name. Uh, one of these some Protestants was by the name of Johannes Piscator. He was a big Bible scholar. He wrote a big work on, uh, on commentaries on the Bible he produced. Uh, he was a very influential German Reformed theologian, uh, very good with the languages. Uh, Piscator had a track record in denying the active obedience of Christ. Um, he didn't deny the active obedience of Christ. He just denied that the active obedience of Christ was imputed to the sinner. This is what he denied. In the 1580s, Piscator exchanged letters with Beza over the teaching on the imputed active obedience of Christ. In these letters, Piscator defined justification as only the forgiveness of sins. So the imputation was for Jesus, excuse me, the active obedience was for, for Jesus, and the passive obedience was for us. Um, Piscator's writing began to spread and local debates and occurred in Switzerland and Germany that ranged from the late 1580s to the end of his life. And one of his opponents in these debates was R. Scott Clark's uh, most favorite theologian, uh, Johannes Molinius. Uh, these deb debates were um, an international discussion, and these debates made it to the English shores, and Perkins was definitely aware of these uh, debates. Justification was very foundational for William Perkins. Luther and Calvin before Perkins considered justification to be very foundational to the Christian church. Luther stated this, when the article on justification falls, all things fall. 
Thus, there is the highest need for us to inculcate and hone it constantly. John Calvin said this about the doctrine of justification. He said, quote, Justification is the main axis on which religion turns so that we may devote the greater attention and care to it. And Perkins would share the same conviction. In a work he published in 1595, Perkins gave an analogy of a house. According to Perkins, when you have a house, right, the windows and the roof, right, and the doors may be damaged, but it's still a house. It can still function as a house. But when you take that house's foundation and you uproot it, what happens to the house? It no longer becomes a house, right? It's destroyed. So Perkins said, the doctrine of justification is that foundation. You take that doctrine of justification away, that house will come crashing down. Perkins summarized the Roman Catholic view of how one is accepted to everlasting life. He said this, the Roman Catholics believe the remission of sins and the habit of inward righteousness or charity with the fruits thereof is Roman Catholic theology. And he says, on this very point, for Perkins, uniting with the Church of Rome was impossible because of this grave error, which we'll talk about in Lecture 2. In regards to the difference on this doctrine, this is what William Perkins wrote. In regards to the difference of justification, he said, we are, we are to stand against the Roman Catholics even unto death. The Reformation had been already happened 30 years into the Elizabethan era. It was put on um, hold for five years under Mary's reign. And although England was Protestant in name, there was a lot of people during Perkins' time that did not believe in the gospel. And Perkins was very concerned. He believed that the doctrine of justification was foundational to the Church of England and also foundational to the Christian faith and life. And without it, it would be over. Without it, the house would collapse. Uh, that ends our first lecture for today, but in our second lecture, we're gonna go more into how Perkins defended the doctrine of justification through scripture against his Roman Catholic opponents. Thank you.